A Musical Life with piano pedagogy pioneer Tim Topham. Tim Topham is a prolific blogger. And host of the Tim Topham TV Piano Teaching Podcast, a resource for piano teachers looking for creative ways to teach and engage their students. Tim's writing and training courses have been featured in several music journals and publications, and he regularly speaks at local and international music conferences. This episode of A Musical Life is brought to you by A Musical Life Mastermind. A Musical Life Mastermind is a place where I teach musicians how to be entrepreneurs, drawing upon my own experiences, pioneering digital sheet music, creating page turning pedals, co founding Air Turn, writing a book, and teaching thousands of people around the world to play the piano through my Claire de Lune from Scratch YouTube series. And my online popular piano school at ArtistWorks. Every week, we have live mastermind sessions, group video chats, where we feature case studies and share ideas to help each other find more students, get more gigs, and explore creative ways to grow a career. If you're looking for a better way to make a living as a musician, I'd like to invite you to join the community at A Musical Life Mastermind. To get started with a free ebook on the number one resource you need to grow your music, visit a musical life mastermind.com. Once again, that web address is a musical life mastermind.com. Welcome to a musical life. I'm Hugh Sung. We're continuing with our special series on musical entrepreneurs with piano pedagogy pioneer Tim Topham. Tim and I have connected several times over the years, beginning back when I was working at Air Turn. Tim has created some amazing resources for piano teachers looking for innovative ways to instill excitement and creativity in their students, including courses for teaching pop piano, articles on integrating technologies like iPad apps into pedagogy, and now a special online community for piano teachers called the Inner Circle. Tim has been kind enough to feature me twice on his own wonderful podcast, Tim Topham TV. So now it's my pleasure to return the favor. Tim, it is such a delight to finally have you on my show. Hugh, uh, likewise, you know, you've been a guest on mine for a couple of times now, and I, I can't wait to, uh, to return the favor and have a chat with your audience as well. It's going to be great. Well, thank you so much, and it's, it's wonderful to have, to have an opportunity to reciprocate. And telling from your wonderful accent, I think everybody can tell that you're from Australia, yes? <laughs> Am I your first Australian guest? <laughs> I think you or, are, to believe it, believe it or not. <laughs> fantastic. Well, I'll say good day to everyone around the world listening today. Oh, lovely. Now, you're based in Melbourne. And I'm wondering if you could share with us, because I've actually never been to Australia myself. Tell us a little bit about the arts environments there. Is there a lot of support for arts and arts education in Australia? Yeah, we're very lucky over here, um, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, to have very big arts scenes. So if there's ever a musical traveling around the world, it'll come to Melbourne and Sydney. Before, uh, it might go to some of the other states of Australia, but always to, to Melbourne and Sydney. Um, we've got a great live music scene here. And um, unlike parts of America, we've got a... a um, in education system that is uh, involves a lot of private education. So um, our education system here, this is our high school and, and secondary kind of school education is split between about 30% uh, Catholic institutions, about 30% government, and about 30%, um, well, that doesn't quite add up, but you get the idea, of, uh, <laughs> uh, of independent schools. And Absolutely. so in all the Catholic and independent schools, um, students can come out of class to have private instrumental one-on-one -on -one lessons and that's kind of a norm at those schools that offer it so 
um, you know, that builds a huge um, quality of um, musician in our students. And, and that kind of builds into when they leave school, um, being able to perform at places. Um, and, you know, arts generally, we've got a lot of galleries too. I mean, we can talk non-music, um, but it is pretty vibrant in Melbourne uh, and as I say, Sydney in particular, and look, I'm biased towards Melbourne, of course. It's got, you know, all the best arts, all the best coffee, all the best food. Hasn't oh, it? <laughs> something tells me I'm in the wrong country. Do you have an extra room in your place? I, maybe I should be moving in with you. <laughs> you come and visit anytime. You, oh, you will love it. Something tells me I would. Oh, I can't wait for the opportunity. Now, you're, as I mentioned in the introduction, you're the host of a very popular blog and podcast Tim Topham TV podcast, as well as a special membership site called The Inner Circle that provides a supportive online community for piano teachers. But before we get into all of your amazing online activities, tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us about your musical upbringing. How did you get started in music? I uh, started formal lessons when I was eight. Um, I think the story goes that we used to travel in the car to Sydney from Melbourne, and that's a good uh, 10 hour drive oh for goodness. holidays. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can imagine, those are the days without air conditioning, and in summer, uh, you know, daytime temperatures would easily get over 80 Fahrenheit here, probably more. I'm, I'm not sure exactly the conversion, but um, so we used to pack in the pack everyone up in the car. I had a brother and a sister, and um, I was given at some stage this tiny little Casio electronic keyboard. I can still picture it. It's about a ruler length long, tiny little keys, an incredible array of incredibly annoying sounds, <laughs> <laughs> including the old bossa nova. Do you remember all those old rhythms that used to Absolutely. be in these little keyboards? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, anyway, and so I don't know who gave it to me, but mum and dad used to hear me playing around with this all the time and they thought, you know, maybe there's something in this. Um, so they asked their friends uh, for a reference to a piano teacher and I ended up with this amazing teacher called Rosemary McIndoe, um, who will make sure listens to this at some stage. Aww. And she was um, living near me. She's now, you know, she's been one of my mentors all my life. Um, she's retired now from teaching, but still um, is great for my own counsel and a chat every now and then. So she, uh, she took me through till I was about uh, 14. I did a whole lot of grades of music. And then uh, I did some study of jazz piano. I kind of I had I had enough of the classical piano, and I, I went over to jazz and studied with one of the best jazz teachers here in Melbourne, oh, wow. uh, who's also still a friend of mine, which is great, and lives just down the road. Funnily enough, um, and then actually my my life took a, a complete turn. I I I went in and studied music at university. So I did a bachelor of music, um, majoring in audio engineering. Oh wow! And yeah, so it wasn't performance. So I I knew that performance wasn't really the thing for me. I didn't particularly enjoy getting up in front of people and playing, mm. but I loved music and I loved, um, I loved sort of conducting or being in a band for a show or, um, you know, doing those you know, repetiteur for musicals, those kind of roles. I used to love that at school. So I went in and did that course. Um, but in the same time as doing that, I really got the bug for PE teaching and out what we call over here outdoor education, which is when schools, a lot of these private schools, have uh, camp programs. So whole year groups go out and go and abseil and rock climb and hike and all this kind of stuff. And so I really got into this. And the music really took a backseat for literally, you're not going to believe this, Hugh, but about 10 years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, from uh, when I left school at about 18 till my late 20s. Um, I still would play uh, and I even taught a few students, but it was very ad hoc. Um, but I had some great friends who were singers and so we'd get together and jam and I'd play piano. So I kept my chops up, but I wasn't really into it as much. What were you doing during those 10 years? That's really fascinating. Yeah. So I was literally, I moved, um, I went overseas and I taught, um, I did a bit of IT teaching and I did some, a little bit of music teaching. And then I came back to uh, Australia and went over to Perth and I was head of outdoor education of one of the private schools over there. So I was running the camp program from grade two to 12 and just spending all my weeks camping and uh, uh, four wheel driving and abseiling and rock climbing and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I loved it. It was fantastic. Oh my goodness. Yeah. There was always this kind of draw to music. Uh, and so I would end up running the battle of the bands for the school, even though I wasn't music <laughs> teacher there. And I'd play for, you know, um, singing practices and things like this. And, you know, it was always there, Hugh, but it wasn't a feature of my life during those sort of eight or 10 years. I, and it's, you know, it's fascinating because I, you, we wouldn't, even think of that because of your incredible presence 
in the piano pedagogy world. So it's really fascinating to get this background insight to you. And it, along the way, of course, you picked up all of these amazing skills in technology, teaching IT and education. And just you sounded like such a well, really well-balanced, <laughs> happy individual yeah. growing up. Yeah, well, I, th- I think a lot of the time that I spend away from music has actually dictated my approach to music now and everything that I'm doing now. And I think had I gone to university and gone to a conservatorium and then become either a performer or a teacher or whatever straight away, I would there is no way I'd be doing what I'm doing now. I wouldn't have the view about music education that I do now. Um, so it was actually really um, foundation foundational in in my sort of current approach that I went and had all these life experiences. I did all this different stuff. I taught and ran camps with hundreds of kids at a time and uh, moved around. I, I also lived in Tasmania on, a, on an island, if you can believe it. I ran a residential camp program there. So all these different experiences, which has really shaped the kind of modern approach and the kind of different approach that I have to teaching these days. Well, it's you really think outside the box and it comes – from quite literally having been outside the box, and that's a, yeah. and that's that's a credit to you to be able to bring the kind of fresh perspective that's so difficult to have when you're immersed in music and never have an opportunity to be away from it, as you so fortunately did. It's really, really eye opening. Mm, yeah, I think it absolutely was. And so when I look back, sometimes I think, oh, you know, I could have even more amazing piano playing skills or something if I'd played all that time. But you know, I wouldn't be having the impact that I'm having around the world with my educational and pedagogical ideas as I am now if I hadn't had that experience. So I'm really thankful now looking back. So going back to the end of your 10 years away from music as a profession, what was it about music that drew you back? I mean, there are other fields. I mean, you certainly, it certainly sounds like you had the acumen and the skills in technology, in education, to do almost anything else. And, you know, it's probably a different perspective because here in America, it's really tough to make a living as a musician, but maybe it's different in Australia. What about music drew you kind of back in or drew you to consider putting more of your effort into it, considering all the amazing talents and abilities you had to do almost anything else? It's a really good, it's a great question. I, I smile and I almost laugh at that because <laughs> it really came back to, uh, to income. <laughs> um, so as I was kind of wrapping up my outdoor education work, I started, uh, I, I got a new um, idea that I wanted to be a music producer, uh, specifically of dance music. So nightclub music, I wanted to remix and I wanted to produce dance music. How and cool. so I started, yeah, I started doing this under my late, uh, my, uh, name, which was Fourth Nation. Um, you can still find me on iTunes, by the way. Oh. <laughs> and I started producing in my um, in my studio, my bedroom, effectively. I started learning how to remix and how to produce dance music. So I had a good idea of the technology of music and things, but I'd never actually done this before. And I started doing this and I thought, you know what? I'm going to make a career out of this. This was my next kind of plan. reality hit pretty quickly um, mm. and sort of a year into it I was having to go back and substitute be a substitute teacher so I was doing a lot of that work to pay the bills um, and then I picked up a piano student and I still remember him um, his name was Henry he was about 14 at the time and he was doing what we call over here grade four so he was kind of intermediate level playing um, and he was about to do an exam and I'd just taken over from his previous teacher. And I, when I had my first lesson with him, I was so out of my depth <laughs> that I, I went, oh, my goodness, I need help with this. So I reconnected with Rosemary, my teacher, mm. my childhood piano teacher. And she 
single-handedly just taught me everything I know now about teaching. Like it was just an incredible, we literally spent six months together. I was over there at her house all the time. We were going through scores. She was showing me, she was doing everything she could to, to help me get this student the best mark possible and teach me in the process. Wow. And I just, I just, I just started loving it more and more and more. And, and that's when I started moving across to teaching piano students and thinking about it being a full-time proposition. Wow. So what was it like trying to get your first students after Henry? What were some of the strategies you used? I'm just curious because, you know, musicians, I think we rely a lot on word of mouth and we rely mm. on perhaps our education or our accomplishments. I, I, t- I tend to look at other music teachers' bios or websites and they'll list, you know, they won such and such a competition, they went to such and such a conservatory what were some of your strategies to get students to work with you? I put ads up online on a lot of free sites. We've got a free site over here called Gumtree. It's also in um, the UK. It's just a free classified site, a little bit like a Craigslist, I guess. Mm. Uh, And I was able to pick up a number of new contacts through that for people looking for local, a local teacher in my area. I made sure I was on any online um, lists of students, uh, lists of teachers, and, uh, and I also started looking for work in a school, um, which was what I really wanted to do. I really wanted to, to get a role in a school that would give me a number of days work without me having to worry about it too much. Mm. Uh, and so that's when um, luckily the position at the school I was substitute teaching at the most at the time, uh, which was called Whitefriars College, uh, they ended up um, having an opening for their piano teacher that was their only piano teacher at the time Uh, and I went for it and I got it so I actually at that stage didn't need that many private students and having worked a lot in um, institutions now I haven't got I haven't had to do a hell of a lot of marketing myself because Mm -hmm. of the the nature of my role that's fantastic now jumping ahead you are now currently the head of keyboard at Xavier College in Melbourne, which I understand is a prestigious Catholic day and boarding school predominantly for boys. How long was it from your first college or your school teaching position before you got that position, and how did you get it? Uh, I think I was at my previous school for about five years or thereabouts. Um, I'm just trying to think. Probably probably uh, five years altogether, about three years in the piano teaching role at the first school. Um, and then, uh, I always just keep my finger on the pulse as you do as a musician to see what roles are going where. Uh, and I saw this, the job at, um, Xavier college came up. Um, this is my third year. So about three years ago, nice. a little bit under, nice. um, and I, I, just, I went, went for the job as per, you know, uh, the interview process. That's really fascinating. And I'm, I'm wondering if you were comfortable talking about this because I would, ma- I would imagine that there would have been a lot of teachers perhaps who had had more formal training, who had applied for the job. What do you think it was about you and your unique mix of experiences that helped you get that position? Yeah, it's a, a great question. The, um, the interview process was actually, uh, it, it involved a lot of playing. So um, we had to, we were given a piece of music to prepare for about 24 hours it was an accompanying position uh, role so i didn't i was i was accompanying a student it didn't have any title or anything i just had to learn the music mm. and it wasn't easy <laughs> so um so i had to i had to do that very quickly and then on the on one of the interviews i had to sight read and accompany a student at a high level on the spot on the stage in front of the panel as well so it it, it turns out that a lot of my experience that i had when i was learning piano and through those years of um, when I was kind of doing the outdoor ed but still playing on the side, a lot of that was a, uh, accompanying and a lot of it was sight reading. Perfect. And so the skill I think that they were most interested in was my ability to connect with a student when performing and to be able to sight read a whole lot of music. And uh, that has been the case. Uh, you know, mm. I have to sight read all the time. Mm. Um, and look, I think a lot of, you know, the, the, these kind of roles in schools – um, revolve around um, per- the right personality, the right person that's going to connect with other staff, going to work together well, connect with students and be able to engage and motivate. 
Um, and so I hope that was that was part of the reason. And I imagine that you know having my business studies and my skills of running large scale programs in different states uh, was also a factor, even though it wasn't necessarily specifically about music. Now, it's interesting, given your experience at Xavier College, I found that you wrote a wonderful article to help teachers with the particular challenges of teaching boys, given that you have had experience now for several years working at a mostly, is it at all boys or are there some girls at the school? There's girls just up to grade four. I see. So just right in the early years. I see. So mostly boys. So I'm wondering if you could share what some of those challenge are, challenges are that you experienced and some of the best approaches that you were able to develop and what you were able to advise other teachers when they're working with boys in their own studios. Yeah, look, I think above all, uh, and this goes for classroom teachers, any anyone teaching boys, we the, the thing you've got to keep in mind, that boys more so than girls are relational learners. Uh, and this isn't a term I've invented or anything. It, it's, it's out there in, in the literature. But by that, I mean... Boys learn best from teachers they like, hmm. and that's just, it's a fact. It's a research fact. Um, I think girls can learn more or less effectively. I mean, sure, they'll probably learn better from a teacher they like, but it's not as important for them. Whereas for boys, they'll really switch off if they don't get the teacher and they don't have that connection. So above all, that is just so crucial. Um, and, of course, building rapport is something that, you know, you can learn to do over time. But for me and the thing I advise all teachers is, is to have a laugh, to laugh at yourself, to have it, you know, to be lighthearted um, and to to take an interest in their lives. And the more you can do that and the more you can make connections between perhaps their sporting lives uh, or their, you know, the, their other hobbies and things like that and the music they're doing, the more effective your teaching will be. That's what I find anyway. Um, and, and as for um, the, mu- the kind of music that they like, you know, I think girls are very open to a whole lot of different musical styles and are much less likely to be concerned when they're given a piece of music they don't really like. They'll, they'll kind of go along with it. And boys will to an extent, but... If you can find the kind of music that really captures them, then you've got an absolute winning situation. Um, and of course, here it, it doesn't. It's not always about you know fast pop music necessarily. A lot of my boys love classical classical music, and that's great too. But it's just it's finding that right mix. And I think it's a little bit harder when you're teaching boys than it is girls. And that's why I have lots of repertoire resources on my site because having a, a list of op- of different selections you can go to can really help. I really appreciate you taking the time to share those incredible insights. It's really fascinating to hear how, I would even say counterintuitive, your discoveries have been. I I would would almost have assumed the opposite for a lot of the things that you mentioned with regards to relating to boys and their temperaments. I would have almost thought that like girls, teaching girls would have depended more on that emotional rapport as more so than boys, but it, it's absolutely fascinating. We really appreciate mm. you sharing those things. Yeah. I mean, in the girls' situation, I've taught in girls' schools as well, and there's an element, particularly in, in a classroom factor, where um, girls as a group um, can, you know, the, the importance of that relation can really uh, affect the dynamic in the classroom. But I think in a one-on-one situation, um, it's, yeah, boys really, you know, if they like their teacher, then you're going to have much more success. Absolutely fascinating. Now, thanks to that wonderful background that you shared at the beginning of the interview, your experiences with jazz and your interest with pop and your your um, indulgences in trying to produce pop, dance music even. It's, it's <laughs> really cool that one of the things you're actually really known for is helping traditional piano teachers learn how to teach pop piano music. You've actually developed an online video course, Piano Flicks, to give these teachers some fantastic tools to teach pop music. And I was actually watching some of those videos and I was so impressed with the clarity and the common sense approach you give, and yet the the really practical musical tools that you share, I'm wondering if you could, if you don't mind sharing why you think teaching pop piano is so important in you know in a field where most traditional teachers put a heavy emphasis on classical music, as well as what do you think the benefits are 
to teachers and students who, or teachers in particular, who might think of pop music more like candy, maybe not as pedagogically sound as their classical repertoire counterparts? Sure. Um, in answer to the first question, the, the reason I think it's important is, one, it's relevant to students. They get it. Yeah. You don't have to teach them about tapering off your phrases at the end um, or the way to pedal or not pedal. Uh, you know, pop music, they understand. They're immersed in it all the time. They listen to it. So they kind of get it. So I think that's that's kind of first and foremost. The second, they, uh, well, most students, and I do have some that don't, but most students enjoy playing it. They like exploring popular music. And if you can get them playing a chord progression of a song they like or a little riff from it, you know, the eyes widen, you know, the smile comes on their face and they can't believe they're playing it when it's <laughs> relatively easy, of course. Yeah, sure. But look, from a pedagogical perspective, I always say when I speak about pop music and its importance, in my opinion, to music, is if you look at what the foundation, the main, main basic building block of music is, and some may disagree with me on this, but in my opinion, it is chords. Mm. It's chords and progressions. Mm. Um, and so if you're not teaching students about chords and progressions, then they're missing a foundational aspect of piano or music pedagogy in general. So for those listeners who might be not a piano teacher, uh, this might be a little bit hard, harder to kind of explain. If you're teaching clarinet, um, you know, it might be a little bit odd to start talking about chord progressions because students aren't playing them. So I'm really talking to a piano, um, piano audience, I guess. Um, those building blocks and learning about chords are just fundamental in my opinion. So if you can talk about chords and teach students about chords using a style of music that they understand and one that is based on repetitive chord patterns, then you've got a winning formula for not only connection, for motivation, but also for a depth of musical understanding, which just isn't possible in my opinion, from learning a Bach invention, even though that's a fantastic thing to learn as well. Uh, you can't learn so easily about chord progressions. Not only that, but in your course, you also talk about the benefits of using pop to help teach the elements of composition and I believe also improvisation, don't you? Absolutely, yeah, because if, if um, a student understands, um, for example, that a piece of music is in the key of C, let's say, um, and they, I, I reference the circle of fifths all the time in my lesson. Um, and for those teachers who haven't used this, then this is a great little trick you can try and try and do. Pull out a circle of fifths diagram somewhere um, and you look for the key that you're working in, let's say it's C, look to the left and to the right on that circle and you've got the six chords, the majors and minors, that tend to make up chord progressions and pieces of music, classical, baroque, romantic, contemporary, jazz, pop, anything in that particular key. So if you teach students about this, you can get them composing pretty quickly by just starting with a C chord and choosing another three chords to make up a four chord progression. And it is amazing how students suddenly realize that music in its essence is actually pretty simple, particularly mm. pop music. Mm. Mm. You know, it's interesting. I've had experiences Believe it or not, at one point I was in a hip hop band for a short while. <laughs> most no, I, most, don't, I don't believe that. Most people don't okay. realize this, but I was actually in a hip hop band. We we were doing some wild stuff, but it was it was an attempt to merge classical musicians with hip hop beats, and I, I I personally I loved it. I absolutely loved the freedom to improvise. But it was interesting because we had another classical musician on board, and we had a composer who was the brainchild of this group. And he wrote out some music and I was, I took the music and I thought, well, what, what if we just changed it around a little bit? Because he wrote a part out for the single line instrument that was rather difficult. And the person was, was practicing really hard, diligently every single note and trying to get every note right and accurate. And, but it was, it was a little bit clunky. And I said, well, what if you just change a couple notes here and just leave some of those out and just did a different kind of riff? And I'll never forget the musician looked at me in horror, like, well, you can't do that. It's not written that way. <laughs> and I'm looking at the composer. We're looking at each other. The composer's right here. <laughs> it's, it's okay. But this person just could not get their minds wrapped out or around the fact that you can change the notes. Yeah, that's right. Well, that, and that's a, that's a classical traditional upbringing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You, and, you, play, yeah. you play what's written. The thing I don't understand, Hugh, is that all of these amazing greats, 
of musical history in any instrument were all Im- amazing improvisers. Yes, yes. That's mm-hmm. what they were known for. Mm. And yet here we are teaching Liszt and Bach and Chopin and, you know, we, all we do is we're just teaching students to read their notes. Mm. When they themselves, I reckon they would turn in their graves to know that that is how students are being taught today. We should be teaching them how to improvise and create their own music just like they used to. And, and don't get me wrong as well. I don't want your listeners to think that I only teach pop and, I, you know, I don't like classical or anything like that. It's, a, it's part of the mix that I use in my, in my studio. And as I've said, for some students, I really focus on the classical, um, but I do teach them chord progressions as much as I can through that. Mm, but, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, uh, I, I challenge teachers to um, avoid thinking of pop as, as you said, candy uh, or, or a treat. It's it can be so much more than that. You can really introduce the backbone, the skeletal structure of music in more creative ways. And as you mentioned, we forget the fact that a lot of the great composers of the past actually took the pop music of their time, the popular dances. Yes, correct. And with the dance music of their time, the folk songs, the songs that were sung by common people and made them into the classical music masterpieces, but they took elements of pop music, if we want to use that lingo, and we forget that so much. Mm. In fact, on uh, Facebook just the other day came up uh, the clip from Armadeus, the movie from about Mozart from a few years ago, or quite yes. a few years ago now, yes. um, where he um, kind of faces off against Salieri. I, I, I don't think it actually ever happened this way, but... He, he he was asked to play some of Salieri's music. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember that scene. At, at the piano, and he starts <laughs> playing it as it's written, and then he just starts improvising on it. And, you know, <laughs> it's like that's what he would have done. That's what we should be doing. And yes. that's what I, I hope more and more teachers are doing, saying, look, here's a written piece. Even if you're not um, so confident with it, you can say to students, well, what if? What if we put this up an octave? What if I do this in a minor key? What if I move it from an A minor to a C major? Mm. These, these are great ways to, to teach and start exploring the idea of improvising. Mm, it's so exciting to hear you speak like this. So I, I want to touch base with now the present time where you're doing some incredible work online. And these ideas that we've been, we've been talking about, you're really having a major impact through your blog, through your podcast, and through this online community that you've created. First, I'm wondering how long have you been blogging and what inspired you to start that medium? I started it in uh, 2010. And so I was at my first school at this time and I was just kind of doing some things uh, that were a little bit wacky in my piano teaching, uh, <laughs> like at the time teaching the 12 bar blues or teaching a student some chords and progressions. And, and other people would hear me teaching and hear what my students were doing and sort of say, oh, wow, how did, how did you do that? What are you doing? How do you do that? And so I thought, I'm just going to start writing this down. I can't remember who the catalyst was exactly for the blogging idea, but I knew I enjoyed writing. I had some good ideas. So I thought, what the hell, I'm going to start a blog and I'm going to start writing down these ideas. And, you know, over time, more and more people started subscribing and leaving comments and trying these things out themselves. And it just built and and grew and grew and grew. And it was never the intention. I really had no plans back then when I started six years ago that it would look like it does today. Uh, But it just goes to show what building an audience and getting great ideas out there can do. Uh, And I think one of the big changes too that is happening now, I think you're probably seeing this with your own community, Hugh, is that people, teachers in particular, are being much less closed door about what they do and about their resources. Mm. When I started um, my teacher education, which was 20 years ago, uh, you know, a classroom was a sacrosanct place. It was your group, your ideas, you shut the door, that was your thing. To have Mm. someone come in and observe Mm. was, you know, just terrifying for most teachers. And the thought of sharing all this work that you've done (laughs) was just, you know, it was just not even considered. I think now the more people that are sharing ideas and and being free with helping, Mm -hmm. uh, the more this is being broken down this barrier. And I, and I, I see it in schools today as well, which is great. I think another key aspect is the fact that you're so generous and then you started your blog, it sounds like, from a spirit of generosity. Simply, this works for me. I want to share this. It wasn't 
this is a great idea. Let me see what I can get out of it <laughs> for myself. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, and 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 even today, you know, I write a blog post um, pretty regularly. I do the podcast, and it's just about sharing great ideas. And I know that's why you know you're doing fantastic things too, Hugh, with oh, your podcast you. and the blogs and the inventions you've had and all this kind of stuff. It's about getting things out there that can help make teaching better, which of course flows on to the students, and that's what that's what we want. Mm. And in, a, in another way, too, that spirit of generosity and quality you know, information that you're sharing, it really gets people to like you better. <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> they, they don't see you as a charlatan or somebody just out to swindle them from something, but they see, wow, he has been so generous. This is so good. This is actually help, helping me. And as you were mentioning, one of the keys of teaching boys is getting them to like you, you know, and, and building that rapport and that relationship. And you seem to, to be a master at doing that, not really by design or purpose, but just simply because you just seem to be such a cool guy to be with and just a great, <laughs> just a great bloke. <laughs> oh, you're making me blush here. <laughs> Look, I, I, I just love, I love people. I love networking. I love connecting with people. Uh, so it, it just, yeah, I, I guess it does come naturally in some ways. Mm. Uh, but it's really, you know, it's lovely to hear you say these things because I do, uh, I do enjoy it. So it's, you know, that, that, that's where it comes from. It's a spirit of sharing and a spirit of enjoyment. Now, of course, for folks who are listening to the show, this is part of a podcast, which is the internet equivalent of a radio show. So I have the same questions for you because now you also, uh, just to differentiate, blogging is kind of the written version where you write articles. We call it, it's a short term for web log, and that's why we call them blogs. They're kind of like online diaries or online newspapers. But now we come into podcasting. And I'm wondering, I have the same questions for you. How long have you been podcasting and what inspired you to add that medium to your mix because blogging takes a certain amount of work and commitment editing i mean you can just throw anything else you you want up but to research something put content of quality that takes a certain amount of time and effort but now podcasting is almost exponentially more so because not only do you have to come up with the content and questions and ideas but then you have to produce it edit it clean it up and all these other technical things what are what got you started in podcasting and how did you get started? I mean, what inspired you to get started with it? It was actually a comment from um, someone uh, that I was interviewing, actually. So uh, the Taubman um, technique is a, is, a, is a group group of people in America um, who have a particular technique that really helps musicians recover from injury. If, yes. if you haven't heard about it, then um, definitely encourage your viewers to explore it at least and find out a bit about it in case they need it in the future. Anyway, uh, the, one of the Taubman presenters was coming to Australia to work with one of our, I think the only fully registered Taubman practitioner here. Um, and I was doing some promotion. I was just trying to get the word out about it. And their suggestion was, why don't you, why don't we do a little interview, a uh, live interview you recorded? And so that we, we did it. And at the end of it, um, both of the people I interviewed said, wow, Tim, that was, that was actually really good. <laughs> um, you, you know, you come across really naturally, you enjoy it, you made us feel at ease. Uh, and thank you for letting us do that. And I kind of went away and I let it, let the idea brew for a while. I thought, what the hell? I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, um, <laughs> and and that was I think about a year ago now. I think it'll be a year in May. I should find out because I must. I should have a, have a first birthday soon. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, thank you for reminding me. I've got to check that. Absolutely. How and, and did did do you realize that you have such a gorgeous voice? I mean, haven't you heard that all your life? Didn't people just come up to you and say, "I love your voice"? Do you? I mean, do you sing? <laughs> uh, look, I do. I don't think I'm particularly talented as a singer. I can sing and I can sing in tune, which is great for a music educator. But look, I don't think you'd want to listen to me singing particularly. Um, <laughs> but I must say it is it is so much fun. I, I love going to your country. Uh, America is is just the best place for Aussies to go because we literally need only open our mouths <laughs> and say something. And, you know, we've got a whole lot of friends. It is, it is <laughs> It is too easy. It's like we've got, you know, a shortcut to the top level of some computer game or something. You know, it is, it, I love it. I absolutely adore it. Um, but no, in answer to your question, I don't know that I sound, that people like, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. 
<laughs> I just, I just, you know, I just hear my voice and I cringe as everyone does when they hear it recorded. Um, but other people seem to like it, so it's it's good. Well, and I think it also helps that you've had you actually studied recording, so you really do understand using the equipment to their best capabilities. Not many musicians know how to do that. Yeah, true. Uh, but I must say the the podcasting, uh, like how to podcast, yeah. I, I just watched tutorials about all of that stuff. Mm. Um, so when I started doing that, I actually didn't have any of my original audio gear from my music producing days. Oh, wow. I, I had to set up again a new and I just followed YouTube tutorials from people. Uh, <laughs> best way to do things, isn't it? Absolutely. I, mm. I, I, I learned from so many YouTube tutorials myself to get this show started. It, yeah. I, I actually want to go back a little bit and I don't think folks realize this, but you and I actually connected several years ago back when I was working at Airturn. Uh, mm. I don't know if you remember this, but you were tremendously helpful in advocating our wireless page turning pedals for reading sheet music on iPads, which was a relatively new idea at the time. Mm. Now, given your prolific blogging and podcasting and online course activities, you obviously have a love of integrating technology with pedagogy. Of course, you also have done some work teaching IT as well. Mm. I'm wondering if you can go back and help us understand what sparked your interest in technology and specifically, what have been some of the best benefits of using it in your teaching? Because you integrate technology in your online courses, in your obviously your, your online marketing activities, your blogging, your podcasting, but you do it so seamlessly. Would you mind sharing what sparked your interest in working in combining your loves of technology and music? Sure. I I can distinctly remember my dad coming home one day from work with one of the very first portable in inverted commas computers. <laughs> it was it was it was massive. It was like uh, it was like four briefcases size <laughs> and the the keyboard kind of unclipped from the front and and it you know took big those big floppy disks and things and um anyway yeah. I, I i i loved i i i don't know i've always had a love of technology i remember always taking things apart i used to love finding out how things work give me an old telephone i would take it apart i would dream you know dream about you know cool technical i can still picture some of the dreams i used to have at that age of things i wanted to pull apart um, and when dad got this computer, I, he was, he noticed how excited I was by it. So he actually kind of built me a, a, a toy one and there's this picture. It was just a keyboard in this wooden box and it was painted. It was, it was the, it was the cutest thing. And there's this photo of the two of us. He's working away on his desk on this massive portable computer. And I'm sitting next to him with my fake keyboard, just typing away. And I like, how adorable. Uh, I, I know, goodness, I know. I've wow. got to find that photo. I've just I've just thought of it now. <laughs> putting a big smile on my face because it's just adorable. Wow. So your father really helped stoke that, yeah. Yeah, and he and he is a big DIY, do it yourself, fix it guy. Oh, and he taught me everything I could possibly have known about how to fix anything around the house. And I used to pull apart cars when I was older and all that. So love I've got that kind of mind that loves make working out how things work and seeing if I can fix them or make them better. And I remember uh, another sort of childhood memory of a uh, I coded a software program on one of these very early computers. It wasn't that one I was just talking about, but probably the next computer he got, which was just a screensaver. Uh, and I did it in basic and it just made lines randomly go across the screen <laughs> and kind of scroll down. And uh, I, I must have been, I don't know, eight or something. Yeah. And and so it's always been in my blood for some reason, this, this idea of technology and loving it. So I, I, as I started learning piano, I, I asked my parents for a keyboard and I got an old Ensonic. Do you remember Ensonic sure, brand? Sure, sure I do. Oh, yeah. It was like, <laughs> it was wooden and metal <laughs> and, and, you know, you could take out some screws and lift up the top and see all the inside. It was, it was fantastic. Mm. So it's, look, it's always been a part of what I do. That's, that's how I got started, I think. And that's how I've got this interest now in technology. Um, and I think you mentioned the benefit or sort of asked me about the benefits today mm. in my teaching. Um, and I think, Technology, we've got to keep it in mind, uh, and I say this whenever I talk about technology, that it's just a tool to achieve an outcome. So 
And, and, and for our students, these millennials or whatever we want to call them these days, technology isn't really exciting at all, uh, not, not in the same way as it is to us. For mm. them, it's a little bit like a pen because it's <laughs> something they've grown up with all their life, right? That's very true. So it's more about what we do with it. And that's why I always stress to teachers, if you're going to use technology, an iPad, whatever it is in your teaching, then have a reason for doing it. Know what you want to achieve. I want to help my students sight read better and sight read in time. Okay, well, there's an app we can use. I might use Piano Maestro for that. Okay, I want to be able to stop carrying around all these books of music. I want to do some scanning in so I've got a reference of my music. Okay, well, we can use Fourscore for that. I want to, you know, you get the idea. Sure, sure. Rather than just go, I'm just going to download every app and then just try it on every student which is kind of fun. I do do that a little bit just to test things out. But I think uh, the, the, the real benefit though is engagement. The students do enjoy it and it can uh, help students understand things that might be harder to do with sort of paper and pen or the memory or your memory or something like that. So for example, I'm thinking of, you know, sight reading and getting students to read in time, having a backing track to play along to and some kind of scoring mechanism can be a real incentive for them. Um, so I think, yeah, the benefit, they're, they're, they're the, that's the main benefit. Mm. You just mentioned a couple of your favorite apps. I'm wondering if you could just also share some of the other tools, equipment. What do you normally use in, what are, what are some of the tools that you use in your piano teaching mix? Well, um, of course, I've got to mention the air turn, page <laughs> saying <laughs> pedal. I, I, I do use that um, because I, I often, if I'm doing sort of two piano works or I'm working with a student who's studying Schubert or something like that, um, if I've got the score on my iPad, I'll be able to turn pages and, and be able to perform and play with him or her and demonstrate things. Um, so that that is absolutely a handy tool. I think the iPad is a necessity um, mm. and I know some people love um Android devices, so tab, uh, Samsung tablets and things. But I honestly think that there's, you know, the iPad is just made for music. And now with the iPad Pro, the bigger size screen, uh, you know, you, you can't go wrong with an iPad yeah. for, for music education. Mm -hmm. So, look, I've got, I've got lots, lots of, of different apps I use, but I think some of the most crucial ones, the ones I really use most regularly, um, I've mentioned Piano Maestro, I think is one of the best apps out there. Um, I'm not sure if it, I think it can work for non piano because it actually listens to you playing. So, uh, you can actually sing into it. And if you get the notes right, it will, um, accept those notes. So I would imagine a clarinetist, a flautist could play into it. So if you've got listeners who aren't pianists, then get them to explore piano maestro. It's a free app and it's incredibly, it's free for piano teachers. That is, mm. and it's incredibly fun to, fun to use. I think my other main ones are Note Star by Yamaha. Am I, are you familiar with that one? I've heard of it. Tell us a little bit about what Note Star from Yamaha does. So Note Star is great for students who are playing pop music because it includes it's not only backing tracks with a rhythm section, but it also includes vocals for pop songs. Oh, wow. I think this is the really crucial one. You can change the key, you can change the speed, uh, and the vocals, still, as long as you don't change it too far, the vocals still sound okay. So you might have a student, I've, I've had ones learning, um, I'm going back a few years, Get Lucky by Daft Punk, great track, four chord song. Um, if you just learnt the chords in a piano lesson, it's pretty boring once they've got <laughs> it, right? Put on Note Star, they can play along to, it's not the original singer, but they're really high quality tracks and they sound great. Uh, and I actually had a student at my old school perform this at a recital and it was it was fantastic, really, really good fun. So that's that's one of my real favorites. And the app is free to, free to download. It's free to preview any song for 30 seconds. Wow. Um, and then each song costs about four or five dollars if you want to download it. Mm, mm, fantastic. Um, iReal Pro is great for any instrumentalist. iReal Pro is it's another backing track app, but instead of putting in sheet music or having to buy sheet music, it comes with all the jazz standards and about a thousand pop songs, mm. and it works off chord progressions. So you can actually see the chord chart in front of you. It goes B flat seven, G seven, whatever it is. You can enter your own chord charts. Really, really good app. It's only about five bucks, I think. And it emulates what real jazz musicians read anyway. They read from the quote unquote real book, which is just those chord symbols, right? Exactly, exactly. And I'll just give you one more, one more fun one. Check out Music Clock if you haven't already. Musi, M U S I Clock, C L O C K. 
fantastic fun app for playing around with scales. They're kind of backing tracks for scales. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, really cool. Not very expensive. Um, and Hugh, if, you, if your readers are interested, I've got a, um, a post on my blog for the best apps uh, for piano teachers, it's called, but great for any music teacher, really. Um, they can just search for that. It's, it's linked from my, my top menu if they are interested. Oh, that's fantastic. We'll try to see if we can include a link of that article and all the other things that you've mentioned in the show notes. So it's just thank you so much for sharing all these resources. No problem. Love it. I, I've got one last question I wanted to touch on. You've recently launched the Inner Circle. We talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the episode, and this is the online membership community specifically for piano teachers. I'm wondering, wondering if you could tell us what inspired you to start this Inner Circle and what are some of the benefits that teachers can expect to find when they join? Mm, great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it too. It's, um, it's obviously something that's really passionate. Uh, I'm really passionate about it at the moment. Um, I, I just, I think I saw that over time, um, you know, my blog has grown to a considerable number of readers now, but there was no easy way for them to actually interact with each other. They could comment on a post. Uh, they could receive my emails, but there was no real sense of uh, community. Mm. And so I've put together the Inner Circle as a community of piano teachers who are motivated and dedicated and creative and really proactive in their teaching. So people that do are doing similar things to what I'm doing or want to do that are the kind of people that I've built this community for. Um, I was also finding, and you, you might have the same experience, Hugh, that I was getting a lot of questions by email from teachers, you know, how do I do this? Yeah. What would you recommend yeah. for that? Mm -hmm. um, and I, ju I just don't have time to answer all those questions. And the problem is that if you answer one question, it goes away <laughs> and no one ever sees it again. Right. And you've helped one person. But, you know, if, if that person could write their question in a forum, yeah then the information's there forever. So I actually felt that creating a membership community was actually a way that I could actually support and help my community um, in a much more effective way and efficient way um, than the old way of kind of emailing and all that kind of stuff. So um, when, when uh, people become members, they're welcomed um, into the community. We have a forum online so people can answer, ask any questions. They can upload resources. Uh, they can support each other. We've got a huge amount of conversation going on, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and I have to say I'm really, really proud of my, my community in that they are so – they're so – uh, modern in their approach mm. and they're doing some really cool things. And, you know, I'm the first to say, you know, I don't have every solution out there and there's plenty of amazing teachers out there that I can learn from too. And so that's what it's all about. But I've now just chucked all my resources in there too. So the Piano Flicks, the Pop Piano Teacher Training Course that you, you mentioned before, that's in the inner circle. That's the, the place that you get it. My downloads, PDFs, videos of me teaching, uh, videos of me using apps. I've just put, I've just gone, you know what, instead of selling a million different products, I'm just going to put it all in the membership and then uh, I just uh, promote the membership to uh, people who are interested in, in becoming part of this community. And they get all of those other things that you've created as part of the membership. Correct. Yep. So that's it. That's where everything, everything's everything gone and everything in the future is going to be. That's incredibly generous of you. It's amazing. So I, I, I said that was the last question, but now I'm thinking of one more. <laughs> sure. You have so many pokers in the fire. You have so many hats that you're wearing and amazing things that you're doing. I'm wondering if you could peer into the future and share... What are some of your long-term dreams? What are you hoping to accomplish? It almost sounds like you're trying to create this incredible revolution in the way piano teachers teach the piano. Are there other larger ways that you're hoping to change the world? Uh, yes. Uh, you've, well, look, uh, the fact that you've been able to summarize it is in, in such a succinct way is, is, it really means a lot because – that's exactly my intention is mm. to create a movement that changes piano pedagogy around the world and therefore impacts more and more students. You know, I realized that as much as I love teaching one-on-one, uh, -on -one, it I can only impact a certain number of students that way. Mm. However, when I present to teachers, when I build my community and write blog posts and record podcasts, I can impact thousands of teachers and therefore impact tens of thousands of students and all around the world. 
And so this, this is what my passion is. This is what I love doing. And this is what I hope to do more and more of in the future. But uh, I think, you know, as, as the community builds, I, I'd love to create more and more resources for teachers that kind of summarize my approach. So I wouldn't call it a method, but an approach I'd like to put together. Um, I'd love to put together a book. You're getting the scoop on this, Hugh. Oh, <laughs> uh, look, look, look out for the book down the track. Wonderful. Um, I'd really, really love to uh, to to write a book. Um, I'm not sure which way it's going to go yet. What topic exactly? Um, and then we've even discussed the idea of some live events. I would love to work with you and some other, you know, top teachers from around the world and put together some incredible live events down the track. So um, that's that's kind of where um, I'd like to move. And give me an excuse to come to beautiful Australia, please. Let's make this happen. <laughs> exactly right. And I'll, and I'll get to come to America where I can open my mouth and make some new friends. <laughs> you mean if I open my mouth and Australia people will not like me over there? <laughs> you know, it's, it, uh, other people have asked me that. And it's, it's just because American TV <laughs> is what we watch. You know, it's, the American accent isn't nearly as exciting as the Australian one is for you. So oh, unfortunately, man. no. But, you know, you're an amazing person, Hugh. I love what you're doing. And, you know, your listeners, viewers, uh, readers, and your community members um, are really lucky to be um, connected with you too. So oh, I can't man. wait to see what we might do in the future. Stay tuned. Absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to share so much of yourself and for all the amazing things that you're doing to impact the world of teaching piano all over the world. Thank you so much. You're really welcome, Hugh. Um, thank you for the opportunity. For links to Tim's podcast and website, as well as a list of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter to get the latest updates on my special series on musical entrepreneurs. And if you enjoy this show, I hope you'll take a moment to tell a friend and post a quick review on iTunes by going to amusicallife.com forward slash review. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.